uh, thank our sponsors, uh, Blue Rose, uh, X Mission, UVU, and uh, make sure to visit all our, our great sponsors down in the corridor. Thank you. Hand it over to Steve. Thank you. Uh, welcome back for those of you who were with me yesterday, and welcome for those of you who are new. Today we're going to be talking about the about Blender again. Blender embeds a Python interpreter. Not just any Python interpreter, mind you. Um, Blender only works with the absolute most recent release of Python, which is 3.2. It doesn't work with older Python, which annoys a lot of people, but when you say stuff like, Blender only works with Python 3 at PyCon, then people cheer wildly. <laughs> it's another example of Blender doing the right thing, right? Like, and, and being kind of a, an excellent example of, of what to do. Because you should migrate to Python 3, and some projects are kind of slow, you know, slowly making their way there, but Blender is there. Um, and today, I'm going to hopefully teach you how to automate a few things in Blender. I have a handful of scripts that I've already authored. We're going to kind of walk through each of those, kind of talk about the different bits and pieces and the hows and whys of how to get those into Blender and how to make them work. And then I'll show you a script that I've actually authored and used to accomplish a very specific task. And then I, I want to add some functionality to that script using what we talked about at the beginning of the lecture. That should take us a whole hour, possibly more. But we'll see how much we can get through. Um, that last bit I've actually not done before. So not only is it just a live demo, it's live <coughs> talk content generation. So anyway, hopefully I don't bore you guys. Hopefully you learned something. So the first thing to do when you're doing anything with the Blender Python API, is make sure you launch Blender correctly. So if you go here and search to where the, the Blender, wherever your Blender app is, I built from source, so I've got it here in this directory, right? Blah, 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 there it is, Blender app. If you're double clicking on this, you're doing it wrong. Please to be starting it from the command line. Um, Windows 2? Windows, uh, Windows, I think, it by default starts, starts with the terminal window in the background. It's been yeah, like all over half a decade since I've used Windows as a regular, so I can't. I've never actually used Blender on Windows. It does. It does. Um, I just realized how snooty, how snotty that sounded. <laughs> I usually use Linux though, so I'm not one of these Apple fanboys. Um, despite how things look. So here we are, at least in, in Apple OS X land. App file is just a directory. You guys see that? Um, <coughs> Blender.app. It's just a directory. So cd in the Blender.app. So for those of you on a real Unix, you'll just add the Blender binary to the path, right? And just launch it that way, or, or do the, the absolute path. So here we are. This is a Blender executable. File, Blender. All 70 megs of it. Okay? You'll notice a few things. There's the executable, and then there's this directory, 2.63. Here is my machine at home that I used to develop Blender. It's running some Linux, right? If you go into a hidden folder in your home directory called Blender, you'll notice, again, this 2.62, 2.63 stuff. This is where Blender looks for its configuration. Okay? And inside you'll see all config directory, scripts directory, etc. etc. On Windows, once again, I'm not really sure where it's going to put that information, but that directory ends up being important ish. Um, but we'll get to that when we get to it. So, <clears throat> a couple different ways that you can interact with. With Blender using its API. I'm going to start the one I know least about. So 
when you start a blender and the key combination is control and then hit the right arrow a few times. <coughs> You come up here and you go to scripting. The top of the screen, see where it says Windows sort of icon, default, and come down to scripting. The things kind of change, and you get this. This thing here on the left is a, is a text area that I could text editor, loosely speaking. If you come in here, you can say print, hello world, right? And if you window here and drag there's a little button called run script when you run script go back to your terminal look hello world so run script I'm gonna hit it a bunch of times look all these hello worlds alright so what you could do is anything you wanted to to get Blender to run you can find the script online or whatever you copy it Come in here, you paste it in here, and then you just hit run. And all the output will go to your terminal. So that's, a, that's an okay way to do it if you like this text editor. I have found that I prefer using different text editors, and so I will I usually do it the way I will show you in a, in a little bit. So <clears throat> the other way you can interact with Blender. Or excuse me, to their API is down here. This Python Interactive Console. Can you can you read that ish? Yeah. I'll try not to linger on it because I don't know that I have very much control over the over the font size. But you know, so import sys print sys. You can control and scroll. Now scroll up. I can get that zoom in on it. Down right down. I was frustrated yesterday. I mean, you can do anything in here, right? Import NumPy if you have that installed on the Python that Blender is using, etc., etc., etc. So import, let's see, bpy dot. Here, it's control space. Control space will have complete or whatever in here. In IntelliSense, I guess they call it sometimes. Bpy dot data. objects, right? And then if I had something called cube, then it would show up here. Let me go ahead and add a cube. I think there's a cube there now. Yeah. Okay. So here's a cube. And if I say, now if I do it, bpy.data to objects and then cube, then it gives me blue instead of red. And that means that's good. So BPI, I guess I should explain it a little bit here. BPI is the main module that you import in your script. So if you scroll up to the top here, you'll notice that built-in modules, BPI, BPI.data, BPI.ops, props, blah, 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 blah. BPI is the, is the mo main module you use to interact with one. I wanted to get at the actual cube object, right? And so what I did here was using the submodule data, which has a dictionary sort of a thing called objects, I index into it by the cube, and then I got this thing. So if I were to say, well, C equals this, right? I can do all the normal Python things, dear C, maybe not this. Oh, I guess you can. Dear help get the docs, the doc string, whatever. C dot name, right? I don't like it. I don't want it to be cu called cube. Let's call it something else. But first, let's review how you would do that traditionally. You'd come over here, you'd click on this, double click on it, and you would call it uh, right, something else. So you 
you see that I changed the name of the object up here in the outliner. Yeah, outliner. Or you can do it here. Right, here's another way to do it. And the data that, that Blender is kind of steward over changes. And anywhere that references it can see that change. So if I were to go c.name equals <coughs> Monster, right? You'll notice it changed here in the 3D view. It changed here in the object tab of the properties um, window. And it changed here as well in your outline. <coughs> so, go ahead. Can you show me how you would get to C again? Sure thing. I said. So bpy.data, which is a bpy struct, then I say objects, which is a bpy collection. If you're actually to make a list out of this, I think, you can see there's a bpy data objects camera, bpy data objects lamp, bpy data objects monster. And so it's like a normal, a traditional Python dictionary. Actually, I should ask that. How many here are comfortable with Python? So, are you comfortable with programming languages in general? Okay, so, so a dict in Python is like a, like a hash in Perl or a hash map in PHP or... Yeah, so it's a key value sort of store, so, right? So basically I index into this key value store by a string, and then it gives me the actual, it pops up, you know, it spits out the, the actual data. So now M is, this, is referencing this actual object. You can do... All sorts of objects. Okay, got it. You got it. You can do all sorts of things. So all I showed was m.name equals, right? I showed you how to change the name, and then you can get access to all other, all sorts of other things. So let's see. Mesh, I think is one of them. You have to have to go bpy.data.mesh. <coughs> Meshes. If you do a dir on your object, it's a little easier to see. Is it? Mesh. Now here's the interesting thing, and I'm not going to delve into this in detail because it's one of those things that's just I spend another three hours just on this. But yesterday I talked about yesterday I talked about the object, and when you hit tab, you're dealing with the mesh, right? When you go into edit mode, you're dealing with the individual vertexes, edges, and faces of a mesh, right? So this might be a little a point of confusion. You're saying, well, you renamed it to Steven, and now you've indexed into this bpy.data.meshes queue. Why did you do that? I thought you renamed it to Steven. If you look here in the outliner, it'll be a little bit more clear. The object is called Steven. It contains a mesh that's still called Q. Right? So if I'm sick of that, then I just say m.name. <coughs> So just to keep in mind, these are two different things. But all I really wanted to show you was this. So now that I have a reference, I guess you can call it, to this mesh object, I can do stuff to the uh, vertices. Right? I can grab the vertices and make a list out of these. You'll see I've got eight vertex objects, right? Makes sense. Four on the top, four on the bottom. So if I were to grab a random one, <coughs> oh, cool. zero. If I want to move it, then I can say dot, what do we got here? CO. Very, very obviously named. Right? The CO is minus one, minus one, minus one. And if I want to change 0 to equal 5, I can do that. Oh, that's incorrect. Actually, I think I have to make a... Uh, no, he's 
was just trying to move one point. But I'm just trying to make this work for you. Why didn't you do that? Oh, did it shift the whole cube? Oh, am I dealing with the object still? No, it's the mesh. Not vertices, zero. There we go. Oh, if you missed that, that's too bad. Hold on a second. Let's do this again. Minus one, minus one, minus one. Forgive the Pepe violations. So, if I change the 555, five. right? So here I am, interacting with stuff in Blender in Python. What the. So what are we going to do with this, right? So import URL lib, URL lib dot open, or whatever, URL open, blah, 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 right? And we've got some, some server running Node.js who's, who's connected to a MongoDB, and it presents this RESTful interface, right? So that we could say in our Blender script, oh, go and fetch me what, I should, what points I should add. And you could store Blender objects off in the cloud, right? Check. I fulfilled the I fulfilled the promise of Utah Open Source this year by talking about the cloud. You're free to go. <laughs> um, you starting to see how awesome this is? Okay, cool. Now you see how awesome this is. Let's stop doing it here in the silly text editor and stop doing it here at the command line. Let's start some reusable scripts. Okay. <clears throat> the end game here. What I want, the point I want to get to, aside from making awesome boxes with points that go in the wrong direction, <laughs> is I want to plot, I want to make a button here that does something. Okay? You think you can do that? I think you can. So, first of all, if you're interested in, in following along, you know, in your preferred text editor at your desk, go ahead and clone this GitHub. GitHub S McQuay will it blend? I added some scripts last night. Okay, and the, I'll just be looking at those here. Vim scripts. Actually. show you, so I've shown you so far how to use a text editor to click run script. Run stuff in that console. Now let's say you've authored a Python script that you want Blender to run. This is how you do it. Dash P, and then some path to a script. And let's see what we've got in here. Simple operator. looking at here? This is just a traditional Python script with an import statement at the beginning. We're importing dpy. That's the module that will give us access to all the interesting stuff. And then we define a class. But before we talk about what's inside of the class or what the class inherits from, let's look right here. At the very, very end, we say dpy.utils.register class my operator. So when one runs, with the dash p of this script, it's going to suck in this class and it's going to register it so that I can use it in Blender. Now let's talk about what this class does. If you look at the execute function, which is what gets called when we go to use it, we print hello world. It's a little bit more convoluted than your traditional Python hello world, but hopefully it'll, this will sink in and start making and apparently you return this, this <coughs> finished set, it looks like. But the class that I'm defining
defining my operator inherits from bpy.types.operator. What is an operator? An operator is anything that you can call in Blender. So when you start up Blender, this is what this would look Dash P. Are we talking to keep in that back a second? Oh, yeah, sure. Alternatively, oh, you're typing in. Okay, alternatively, you could you could just clone the, the GitHub or you could just download the file. Well, or just, I'll wait. I can wait. We're going to run out of time pretty quick, but. GitHub.com, S. McQuay, Stephen McQuay, slash, will it blend? And then if you look down here, then we got scripts. Got it. And we've got the simple one. Let's just, we're doing the simple operator right now. So you could just copy and paste this right here. Yeah. Got it? Okay. So back to this. Back to this. All I'm going to do is I'm going to start Blender. Watch this to make sure that nothing got not, nothing blew up and nothing got dumped to my terminal. So far, so good. And you, you may ask, okay, great. Well, let's remember what this thing is called. It's called my awesome operator. Okay. And let me take a, let me take a moment to talk about this. There are a bunch of these special class variables, class level variables that you can define. That, that, are, that specify behavior or name what your operator is called for future use. So you'll notice here I, I've defined two. And I believe this is the minimum you need. BLID name, so this I think is what you end up using inside of scripts, and the BL label, blender I think is the, the prefix. That's what this is. My awesome operator. Okay? While we're here, let, let me segue, let me tangent a little bit to talk about kind of the state of Blender, Python API, and, and resources and what, what have you. Because the API is in kind of in flux, and by kind of, I mean it's changing quite a bit. Um, it's only getting better, I guess that's the good news. But it's, the documentation, I would have to say, I read doc, better documentation, including like the actual Blender user manual. Um, but all this stuff is more or less documented. It's just kind of hard to hard to follow. And I'll show you how to get there. But they talk about you know the importance of these things. But when you try to look for a complete list of all the ones you can specify for different classes, I don't know I had trouble searching the docs. But maybe we'll spend five minutes at the end just kind of looking at this head. Anyhow, but what what you need to remember is this my awesome operator because in Blender you have the space bar. Thing, right? You can type anything in here, cube, and it looks through all of the operators and then it lets you select them from here. So let's go awesome. I've got my awesome operator here. When I click on it, I check the terminal, that's what I got. How do you how do you get it to input that script in here? Dash P. Same thing. Just leave that. Okay. All right. You launch Blender from the term from the cmd.exe and specify the dash p. But there are other ways that are superior. Well, that are different, I should say. Yeah, it, it, remember it comes up with the command line. But uh, yeah. But then my command line disappears. Yeah. Yeah. It's a setting that you can set. But we, well, let's not worry. Well, yeah, don't worry about it. Keep going. We can figure that out. So. We define an operator. This did something useful, right? You could print something else. You could fetch a URL. You could grab bpy.objects. Blah blah blah. And do stuff in here. Um, let's see. Vim scripts. Okay. But I would venture to say that it's.
it's a little bit annoying to have to launch Blender every single time with this dash P with the absolute path to a single script, right? You have the most efficient way to do it. So I'm going to show you another way to get your scripts into Blender. This 2.63 directory, which once again in Linux is in your you know home directory slash dot blender slash 2.63, has a script subdirectory. Each of these subdirectories has a different use. And I, I believe that what I'm going to show you is not absolutely right, but it's functional. So I'll refer you to those docs or to like town blender coders or something like that on free code. Um, but I did start up. And then you'll see dump.py. Just so you know, it's under help, toggle system, console, Windows. Oh, it is? Oh, cool. Like in Blender itself, and it'll pull it back up. Mm -hmm. Very cool. Thank you. So if you actually zoom this guy up, you'll see it's one that I've opted, and we'll get to in the end, right? So what I typically do, because I've got my my code in some repository, right? I'll just do a symlink. Um, source, will it blend? Let's see, scripts. Yeah, ignore this for a second. Do. You were going to add a oh. link in Blender to yeah, and scripts to go to your script. Is that what you're going to do? I'm going to use a symlink of my scripts into that special directory so that Blender can pick them up when it starts up. Yeah. So let me just do that really quick. Cool blend scripts. So simple operator. We'll start with that one. 2.63 scripts startup. So now, Blender. Now I just start up Blender. No pulling up the text editor, copy paste. Blender just found it and did the right thing, right? So now when I click on my awesome operator, it says hello world. That's what I would suggest to you, right? Have your your scripts under version control somewhere, symlink those scripts into the version number slash script slash startup, and then it will show up every time you open Blender. I'll try to figure out or if you want to find out the, the right way. I remember telling somebody I did that, did it this way in IRC, and they said, well, actually, and so it worked, and so I continued on my merry way because I was trying to prepare for this presentation. Um, and I wanted to have something work, something to show. So now I've got all of that stuff in there. Oh, and actually, I wanted to work work up to this eventually, but oh good, it's not here. Oh, I just seen what the one. Okay. So I'll ask 2.63 scripts startup, and you'll see all I have is my dump.py and my simple operator. Well let's symlink something else. Let's symlink simple tab. Okay, because in all honesty, I mean, I'm I'm okay with I'm okay with doing this this space thing and doing awesome operator and clicking enter, right? But wouldn't it be nicer if you could come over here in the side and have like a little button that you could push? These things are called. More or less familiar. Import vpy. Define a class that inherits from 
that inherits from something in, in D pi. Define a bunch of these BL variables. Define a function or two, and then register it, right? So very similar shape to that last script that we wrote. But this time, some key differences. Imports bpy.types.hem. This should look familiar, ID name, right, ID label. So now I think if I were to do a, a anyway, I, I believe this has to be unique across the entire, um, no, 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 sorry. This, let me run it, right, and then, and then talk about it so we can Hey, how did we find you again on GitHub? Uh, S McQuay, S M C Q U A Y. So GitHub.com slash S M C Q U A Y. And then this one here will look like Q U A Y. S M C Q U A Y. S M C Q U A Y. So basically, oh, here it is. What I've done is. You'll see up here, there's this thing called SERPs with this button in it. <coughs> so that oh, there it is. Up here in the top. So I'm, what, what we're looking at, I should have given some context to the code we're looking at, but we're trying to get this thing here in the side panel. Okay? So here's the ID SERPs. This is what happens in a little expandable, collapsible thing. Oh, this is the one that I... Oh, I messed up. This was also supposed to just be a simple hello world sort of a thing. But it's not. But you can basically say, where should this go? It should be in the 3D view. In which region? It should be in the tools region. Right, so let's see, what does that look like again? Here's the 3D view, right? Here's the tools region. And what this poll method does is it lets Blender know, should I actually do anything with it? Are we in the proper context? And this, this code just basically says, as long as the context, as long as something is selected, as long as an object is selected, then go ahead and show that button. So you'll notice, hey, where'd my stuff go? I thought I would added it in here. Well, if you actually select something, then it shows up there. Or if you go add a cube, then it shows up there. Right? So if you give me a second, I had a more Hello World version of this. simple operators. Now when I start up Blender, here we are. I didn't want to start with the button, I wanted to start with, with this one here. Here's my Hello World panel. Right? It displays the name of the currently selected object. <coughs> See, I'm selecting objects and it's changing. And it allows you to change that name. It changes down here in the 3D window. It changes up here in the object, in the outliner. Right? And it changes here in the. So you can change it anywhere now from. You can change that name here, or here, or here, or go into the Python script. And you can change it there. And it changes a little bit, right? Not so much black magic. Let's look at that code. Serps, 
Okay. Import bpy again, register at the bottom, and defining a class that imports from bpy.types.panel. Define a bunch of these special blender variables. These two dictate where it shows up. This one dictates the, the text that goes by this, the little swivel that expands it and tracks it. I figured out how to do it in English. Okay. Yeah, you just put it in scripts slash start up and boom. So and just there. Yeah. Is, yeah? Is draw an inherited method for panel? Yes. Just one that you're overwriting. And then poll to let it know whether it should be rendered or not. And then here we are. Here's the fun stuff. So basically we say, context, give me the object that's been selected. Bob. Right. And then we use self.layout to create a couple of things. Self.layout.row creates this little row object. You can set the label on that row object to be object name, right, text equals some string, icon equals some string. There's a list in the documentation that I finally found of all the things that can go in here. I chose world because, well, a little world, right? It's a little world icon. Um, and you get another row. You say row.prop is the object, see, that you got on line 10. And you want the main property from that object. So it does all the GUI linking, right, to say, to do. make it so that when you change this field, it actually changes it on the object. And then from there, Blender takes care of making sure that it changes everywhere else it needs to change. So I just pass this review. Sure thing. So all we did was you say this row thing, which is of type, and we can look that up in the document in the, in the documentation in a second, of some icon type, has this property function that takes the first parameter is an object, the second parameter is a string that is the, the property, right, the Blender pop property. And then that hooks, that makes all the linkages to make sure that you can change it there, it changes it. Okay, when do we have to end? Is it 10-2 or do we end on the hour? Let's go the hour. The next class is going to start to around. Six an hour. Oh, then we'll go to the hour. I just find it interesting that they put that, that as a method of of a row object. Yeah, it's a little it's a little bit convoluted. I'm still learning how to do it. So the row is referring to the panel, right? A row of the panel? Yeah. Yeah, in fact you see it's self.layout, right? Self is the actual panel. It has this layout thing inside of it, and that layout thing has a row function that will return a row, and I'm assuming behind the scenes it creates a row and keeps track of all your rows and mm -hmm. lays them out, etc. Probably just a different layout manager. Because in the note description. Sorry, can you skip one more time? Mm -hmm. Oh, one second. Let me see. Okay, I got it. Yeah, I'm sorry I'm not explaining this super well. This one is basically just a. You know what? It's on, it's on your back world. It's on the. Go ahead. It's a hello world that's on the um, on the Blender docs. I'll show you what that is in a second. But let's say you want to do something useful, right? Like let's say, for example, so those who came yesterday will recognize this guy. The mighty Easter Bunny. My wife made these for our kids, and so I thought, anyway, I used it because it was pretty. It was a fairly re a relatively simple thing to, to render, to mesh up in Blender. So there he is, right? So I'm, I'm in the middle of writing a library for Python to do, to add subdivision surface schemes to SciPy. To test that out, rather than hand code, Write some JSON files or whatever with vertex, edge, and face data inside of it, right? Because I'm not really as good at punching in numbers in Vim as I am as at pushing vertices around in Blender. 
I created a thing, a little operator, right, to use the terminology we learned earlier, called dump mesh. It brings up this, um, this dialog, defaults, I, I forgot I did this, defaults the name of the object here, names it .json, and you put it wherever you want. So I'll just, I'll just dump it and put it there, and then let's go look at it. So here's a simple, I guess, object is the right JavaScript term, that has you know, key values, edges, which is just a list of indices, edges, faces. The, the most interesting one is down here is the Bruce, right? So here are, when I get to the top, wow, there's a lot of vertices in this one. Here we go, vertices. There's a list of lists, right? So it's a 2D array of point, point, point. Similarly, so the index into this one, so this is point 0.0, point 0.1. Something in the edges list is going to be first point, second point, right? So it would be 0, 1. And then if I wanted to join this point with this point, create an edge, it would be 1, 2, so on and so forth. So that's the information that's, in cap that's encoded here in the edges. So 51, 1 means take the 51st vertex, take the 1st the vertex, and create an edge out of those. Similar with faces. Right, faces is a collection of four vertices. Index one from nine to one. Cool. So, so just so you have some some background before we start looking at this script. To know what what the end game is, what, what we're trying to do. So this one's a bit more complicated. And this one I did following a tutorial or something that I found that, that's in the Blender documentation. I would do this one a little bit differently. Imports at the top, registers at the bottom. And then I've defined this function, dump mesh to JSON. Let's so not worry about the contents yet. And then this object called dump mesh. Okay? Dump mesh should look a little bit familiar, right? Inherit from some of the BPI stuff. Specify some of these variables. Define some methods, right? Pull and execute. And it's feasible, one second. It's feasible to, to, to and you can imagine now, when I run it into execute, I'm just going to be calling this function. So when I run this operator, this is the code that gets called dump mesh the JSON is defined above. Okay? You see how that all works together? This code exists on surfaces. My my account on GitHub slash surfaces. If you want to actually pull it up. A couple of interesting things. Export helper, which is at the very top here. From BPI extras to IO utils import export helper. That's what made it so that it did some clever things. File name, um, I believe that's what makes it so when you define this file name extension, it defaults the same dot JSON instead of dot text or something. Um, I guess Blender just decided to use the object name, you know, so buddy.json, it did that automatically. But the, I mean, this is the kind of the idea of what you do, right? You specify filter glob, for example. If something of type export, <coughs> has a filter glob variable set on it, then it uses it, right? Dot JSON. So it, it, what you would have noticed is if, even if I tried to dump that JSON file into a directory that was full of files, image files, text files, C++ header files, whatever, the only files that would show up there would be the JSON file. Not the way you specify that is one of these. Oh, in fact, here I've specified options is a, is a set, I think. I'm not, I'm not super good at Python 3. I think it's a set. Uh, hidden, so it automatically sets in the file browser whether you should be showing hidden files or not. That's a dictionary. Is a dictionary? Well, usually dictionaries have 
string colon something, right? Oh. It's Q value, right? So okay, sorry. I don't know either. Anyway, but this thing is all over the place, right? You return one of these here and the execute. It's there in the options. Um, so are you guys kind of seeing what the big picture is here? Let's look at this actual dump to JSON. Actually, let's not do that. Let's look at execute. Execute is passed in a context. And dump to JSON basically gets that same context, which is basically what the user has selected, right? And this self.file path, which is another one of these things that are hidden away in export helper, right? So here we are, dump to JSON, gets that same context. The first thing I do, because, okay, what I'm going to do is I'm going to grab the bmesh thing on this object. It's going to actually have the vertices, the connectivity information, etc. But in order for me to grab that, I have to first change modes, right? So blender modes, that means... So I say add cube. Now I'm in object mode. If I change that to edit mode, now I'm in a mode where I can actually grab that mesh information and use it. Okay? So let me show you how you do that programmatically. So context.object basically, right, context is what the user has selected. Dot object is the object the user has selected. Dot mode is the mode that object is in. Well, if it's in object mode, it's not what we want. Let's change it. So you do vpy.ops.object, which is that same object, a cube in with what I was doing in the inter in the interface. Mode set, mode equals edit. The API feels a little bit, I don't know. It's nice to have. I mean, I'm sure it's better than how it's been, but some, I don't know. I would have done that. Anyway, so I say context.object.data, and I get this little, mesh, I believe. And then bmesh, which is a different thing you have to import. bmesh is part of the Blender. Um, it's, it's one of the default modules that comes in Blender. You import bmesh, and you say bmesh from edit mesh, and you pass in the edit mesh. And all of a sudden, you've got what you want. This B is what I was trying to hunt for. I couldn't have done that had I not switched to edit mode. And I couldn't have done that well, you had to get the mesh first and then pass that in, and it gives you this B mesh thing now. So if we were to run a type on, on this B, then you'd see, oh, it's this B mesh type. I could say, I can do interesting things. Like for example, I can say B.verts, and I get a, I get a list of, of the, ver the ver vertices, the vertexes. Right? And I could say, so all I do here is I traverse this structure. I say, make a Right? List comprehension. So I'm making a list. Each thing in there is going to be a list. Right? I just listify this vert.co, which gives me that, that tuple, 1, 1, 1, 1, 1, 1, 1, 1, 1, 1, 1, so on and so forth. Out of everything, you know, for vert in v.verts. That's, that's Python syntax. If it's, yeah, that's, that's Python syntax. I'm traversing v.verts, converting it into a list, and then storing it in data, which is an empty dictionary, at the vertices key. So basically, rinse and repeat. I do the same thing for edges for any given vert, faces for any given vert. I get all the edges and store them in data, edges, faces for edge. I, I'm just traversing, I'm traversing B, all the different things that B contains. B has edges, B has verts, verts have link edges, verts have link faces. And basically, I'm pulling that apart and then storing that into a dictionary. Which at the very end, I've got this big dictionary. I just do a JSON dump, right? Right into file path, which was the file path that the Blender machinery stored from what the user had entered in earlier, right? JSON dump dump is just a native Python. It's a yeah, yeah. Import JSON is a copy problem. Yeah, you'll dump. So 
dubs that into JSON for me, and then <coughs> the last thing I do is I don't want to leave the user stranded in edit mode, I set the mode for my object back to object mode. So really, what, what that thing is doing, you can do interactively, right? You can come in here, you can grab each of these vertices, write them down, put them into a text editor as JSON, and then come back out of edit mode. But that takes a long time, and instead, now you just go um, dump mesh. ASTF.json, I hear a recent bullet when. Right next to, to Bunny, I'll dump the mesh. ASTF.json, and here we are, much smaller. That's all the information from that cube. Which, okay, so you may be asking, well, what are you doing with this? Well, I use that information in that JSON file, run some of my algorithms in it in nat native Python, and then dump that back to a JSON object that Blender can then load and display. Okay, so let's look at the load code really quick. Um, actually, we don't have time. What I want to do is now, instead of making the user press space, I want to just click on a button here. Select an object, click on a button, and then it lets me dump stuff in the file. Okay? So how do you do that? So the, the, the main line here is this is a panel class that I'm defining, right? You say self.layout.operator, and you give it a string, which is one of those BL underscore ID or something, right? How do you get at that? And now, that button, this will give you a button that is bound to that operator. So if you look now, my operator is down here, BL.ID name, object at my operator. So you notice this string, and the same as this string. What Blender will do is Blender will say, in this layout, I'm adding a button that maps to this guy, and then it will use what it finds here. This one is another just hello world, right? Is there a whole interface written in Python? Or That's a good question. It's all written in C, it's written in C++, but it's configured the layout is done in Python. So if you actually go into the, that directory, they set up their buttons the exact same way you are. Yeah. So yeah, I'm being critical. I'm being a little bit critical about the API, but they they're I have a, I venture to say they had some experience with this, right? So here is my panel. I have no button. There's a namespace collision. They both have the same ID, the first one we want. Right? But now I can say my awesome operator, when I click on this, it's in Hello World. Right? Great. So in the last five minutes, do we want to try and add my dump file as a button? Okay, so where do we go to learn about this stuff? I want to see what you did and then re-import it. What cool stuff you did to the mesh. Oh, yeah. That, when I'm done writing that code, then I'll do a presentation on it. How's that sound? <laughs> <laughs> right. um, yeah, I can talk to you about it afterward. It's, it's going to be really cool. So, I always just do this. And Blender, Python, API. 
first link. It, it generally takes you to the most least recent version of it. These guys here are good to read through, give you a good overview. Actually, it's all, it's all pretty good to read. Um, some of it goes over beginning Python stuff that you would get in a normal Python tutorial or from knowing how to use Python, but it's good. Good for beginners. Um, here's information about the operators, here's information about the data, so on and so forth, the utility functions. I'm trying to think of work, what I used this morning. I wanted to find out what the different strings I could use in that icon. Right? They use the world one in the hello world, and I wanted to use a different one. I think I went to like Python. No, it wasn't that. It was operators. Ops. No, it wasn't here. I think it went to modules. Oh, here, it lists, it lists them all out. When you come down here, you can see bpy.props, right? And this traditional Python documentation with examples, the entire API listed out in the package. So, That's how you learn about stuff. Any questions? Let's try. I do, I do kind of want to show you this one. Then, both, and no. Right? All you have to do to get my code working with that button that we set up is change this object of my operator. Object of my operator, if you remember, is referencing this object of my operator VLID name. Mine has a VLID name as well, called object.dumpmesh. So if you change this guy to be .dumpmesh, right? Let's go ahead and get rid of this my operator stuff. Get rid of this. Oh, whatever. We'll let, we'll let the user be able to change the name of the object. Right? Now I can change this to bunny. It can look anything like a bunny. Dump mesh. And all of a sudden, that code that I wrote that I tested, you know, using the as a simple operator, space, typing the name of the operator in, works as expected. What will it learn from? So if I wanted a dump mesh and a load mesh, right, I would I would make sure that my load mesh code was imported, add it there, and I would have both those buttons right there. Questions? Can you just run that and show us the buttons? Oh, show the show the load one? Yeah, yeah. Um, say, well actually I want this to show up all the time, so I have to change that, but load mesh, will it then, Glenn, bunny, there it is. <laughs> now, you have to take the mesh and then add the operator, the operators that I had before, right? All, I, all my code does is deal with the actual mesh geometry vertices, edges, and faces. So what I would do eventually is, right, right now I've got this dump mesh, load mesh business. Uh, you have one button, you click the button, it makes, a, it makes a HTTP connection to a server that presents a RESTful interface to my library. It does, crunches all the numbers and spits JSON back at this, and then it loads it back up in sequence, right? Now that it's saving the file. 
That's it. I hope this was educational. I hope that you learned something. You're free. subdivision surface scheme that I did. So, so basically what you can do is you can, you can tell Blender to basically smooth out a mesh. Right? The one that Blender implements is called the Capital Park subdivision surface scheme. So I did see that yesterday. Yeah. So, but, and, I, and I mentioned yesterday that it, um, it takes your edge of your, your mesh and it makes it smaller at each, at each recursive subdivision. So, this, so there's a scheme that this lady out of Israel came up with near a bin. It's called the Butterfly Subdivision Scheme. It's, it's interpolatory. So that, what that means is that if you have your mesh, instead of getting smaller, it crushes those points and then smooths out 